Welcome to IAS number 16, Property Plant Equipment or PPE. So property means the land and building, plant means factory, equipment means the uh, equipment that we use in our production process or perhaps computer, that kind of stuff. So in the IAS number 16, Property Plant Equipment, what sort of things that we'll be covering? The first thing is in relation to the initial recognition, which means uh, when should we recognize uh, the uh, transaction as the PPE rather than anything else. So it's quite important that we understand that the, uh, the item that we'll be using in our business, perhaps we can recognize it as a PPE. So something that we hold it for sale and that's an example of inventory. And some things that we are holding it, but not using it at all, but holding it for rental purposes or uh, capital gain purposes, is an example of investment property. So after we've covered initial recognition and determining that's an example of PPE, the next thing is the initial measurement, which means what value is that we're going to put onto the PPE. Are we going to put $100 or $1,000, something like that? And after that, very importantly, subsequent measurement. Because as we may have learned before, that the concept of depreciation, which means according to the uh, accruals concept in the conceptual framework, we are using the asset to generate future economic benefit. At the same time, we have an obligation to match the uh, expense with the corresponding benefit. And that's the reason why subsequent measurement comes into being. And after that, we'll be having a look at when the asset is temporarily retired and not being used by the business. Uh, so how are we going to cheat it of course, the idea is when we are retiring an asset, which means temporarily we are not using it, but we still have to depreciate it. Unless the asset is derecognized, which means sold to others. We're going to be recognizing the gains losses on disposal, or perhaps we have an intention to sell the asset, uh, if it meets certain criteria, it has to be uh, reclassified as a non-current asset held for sale under the IFRS number 5. And finally, we'll be looking at the disclosure requirement okay, of the I-16. For example, this disclosing the PPA costs, accumulated depreciation, uh, who values the uh, property plant equipment if the revaluation policy is used. Right, and these are the uh, things that we'll be covering. Now, let's see the uh, initial recognition first of all. Of when should we recognise the item as the PPE. So first of all, it has to meet with the definition of the probable inflows. So for example, if you are using the uh, PPA, it is probable to generate into additional revenue because we can uh, use this equipment to sell more items or perhaps reduce our cost because we are using the equipment so the workers in our business are more efficient in getting things done. So reducing the expense and it meets with the first criteria and in practice the probable inflows um, is very easy to be manipulated. I would say that I've got something there, I pay for something because I think it will give us benefit and um, this is no problem for that whatsoever. Unless there will be objective evidence that we purchase something in the first place and uh, that item has been damaged and we need to question about whether or not we can use it in the long term. But uh, if the 
uh, assets that we bought or that we acquired is in good condition and there will be no problem whatsoever in meeting with the first criteria, probable inflows. Second, the expense can be reliably measured, which means how much that you spend uh, in acquiring the asset. Uh, have you spent $100, $1,000, $1, $1,000,000, something like that? Can you trade this, trace this amount back to the invoice on the corresponding contract in the first place? And very importantly, in order to meet the definition of the PPE, it has to be the internal use. Which means you are using it in our production process for internal use, not for sale purposes, and that's an example for PPE. If you meet with those criteria, no problem for that, you can recognise the PPE in most circumstances. By the same time, according to a conceptual framework requirement, we also have to consider the concept of materiality. So materiality means if the item is large, we're going to recognise it as the PPE. If the item is relatively small, we are not going to recognise it as a PPE, but rather we're going to be recognising it as an expense. But what do I mean by PPE and what do I mean by expense? Well, the PPE, we should put it onto the face of this statement of financial position, I could call it the balance sheet, under the non-current asset section. The expense, though, put it into the P&L as an expense, reducing a profit down. To a certain extent, you can also say that we capitalise it or we can put it as a cost, which means we recognise it as the PPE. And of course, in particular, for those complex assets, for example, you can think about the aeroplane, uh, we've got different components in there, for example, we've got engines, we've got chairs, desks, and so on and so forth. And if we were to mix them up all together, you can say that it's like a, a cash generating unit, uh, and that's an example of a complex asset. And here, according to ICE number 16, when we are depreciating uh, the, the single asset or the complex asset with different components in there, we need to apply different uh, depreciation methods. Perhaps, for example, for the engines, we're going to depreciate it uh, using five years. And for other parts, for example, the spare parts, um, and uh, for, the, for the steel and for the, for the chairs, we're going to be depreciating them uh, using three years or eight years, something like that. So, which means different part should be depreciated separately. So that's a very, very important uh, requirement in the eyes number 16, and you will see an exam standard question later on. And of course, uh, when we are considering the initial recognition, the next thing is related to the uh, equipments that we bought for safety and environmental reasons. So sometimes that we bought or acquired those elements, uh, but these elements do not really meet with the definition of the probable inflows at all. Because we purchased, the, for example, the filter equipment in the, uh, in the business just for safety reason or environmental reason, but that does not really uh, bring us additional revenue at all. But here, according to ICE number 16, if you haven't bought or acquired those equipment, you can't really operate your business or even the business license cannot be obtained. And in this case, this equipment can be recognised as PPE. We bring them onto the face of SFP instead of bringing them onto the face of the P&O as an expense. So if you are happy with the uh, criteria uh, listed, for example, probable inflows, reliably measured expense for internal use more than one year, materiality concepts, 
and, and also talk about the complex asset and also for the uh, acquisition of safety environmental equipment, that kind of stuff, until you gain the full marks in the exam. Now, let's have a look at a few examples related to it. The first example on the screen is called Traveller. And this question is testing you about the complex asset in relation to uh, different depreciation methods applied. Let's see the case. Traveller acquired a new factory on 1st December 2010. The cost was 50. Residual value of 2. So residual value means at the times that we purchased the uh, property plant equipment, we may estimate what would be the future value coming into our business if we were to sell that asset at the end of a life. So according to IS number 16, the residual value should be considered if that value is significant. If this is not the case, we're not going to be considering the residual value when we are calculating the depreci depreciation expense. The factory has a flat roof, okay, which is a separate asset, which needs replacing every five years. So remember, when we are determining the, uh, for example, using the straight line method to depreciate the asset, we will consider the life of the asset, for example, uh, the life is five years because it needs to be replaced every five years. So it seems that the factory should be depreciated. For example, in the next sentence, the useful life of the factory is 25 years. We should depreciate the factory at 25 years and the flat roof for five years separately. But uh, in this question, no depreciation has been charged and a uh, traveller wished to account for the factory and roof as a single asset, okay, and depreciates the whole factory over the economic life, which means uh, it wants to depreciate the flat roof for 25 years. No, you can't really do that. So we use the straight line depreciation, which means uh, we're going to depreciate it, for example, uh, based on the number of years, in this particular case, um, based on the costs minus residual value. Okay, so that's a very, very important concept. Now, how can we calculate the depreciation expense then? So let's see the question called Traveller, we can use T for short. I've got a factory first of all. We've got another asset, it's the flat roof. Okay, the flat roof, uh, when we're calculating depreciation expense, we use the cost of 5 million and minus residual value of 0 over 5 years, and that's why we got 1 million of depreciation expense. How about for factory? The factory total would be 50 million, but it should be excluding the flat roof cost of 5 million. Uh, have we got any uh, residual value? No. Yep, we got a residual value of $2 million for the factory. So minus 2 over 25 years. This means when the factory is fully depreciated, the value will automatically become the residual value worth of $2 million. If we calculate that, it should be one point. 72 million, so total depreciation expense will be 2.72 million, so the accounting treatment would be to debit depreciation expense, we put it onto the p and as an expense to reduce the profit down by 2.72. At the same time, we credit accumulated depreciation, uh, this is the contra account, onto the statement of financial position, just to reduce the PPE carrying value down by 2.72 million. And that's why in this particular paper, in this particular exam, I would normally recommend my students not to credit the accumulated depreciation because you are not asked about the uh, T account for accumulated depreciation at all in this particular paper.
So in this particular paper, I would highly recommend my students when accounting for PPE, we directly credit PPE up carrying volume by $2.72 million. Okay. So that's how we account for uh, the transaction like this. But let's now look at another example related to the acquisition of asset for safety and environmental reasons. So looking at the question called AA company installed the filter equipment but uh, spending $10 million uh, of the machine but the filter equipment was free. Of course, for the $10 million, we put it as a PPA. It meets with the initial recognition criteria. At the same time, how about for the cost of filter equipment? Well, the filter equipment did not directly increase the future economic benefit, which means it does not really increase the future sales or reduce the future expenses. But it's for compliance reason. You have to comply with the laws and regulation. And in this case, according to IS number 16, we should capitalize the 3 million of the filter equipment as the PPA. Okay? Simply, simple for that. Let's look at the example number 2. The recoverable amount of the machine after the filter was installed was 12. Which means, in the first example, 10 million for PPA and then 3 million for the future equipment total would be 13 million but now we are told it's only 12 which means it's been impaired or reduction in value by 1 million dollars and in this case we have to charge the impairment expense by debiting the impairment expense in the P&O reducing the profit down at the same time credit PPA at carrying value or CV if you like by 1 million to reduce the non current asset value down by $1 million. How about example 3? Let's have a look. Local environmental laws require heavily polluting businesses to have at least 60% of their surrounding areas green to absorb dust and other harmful gases, which means they have to plant trees and flowers. So it incurred $30 million for the afforestation and landscape in and around the main plant area. As you can see, these trees and flowers that do not really uh, contribute to the future income or reduction in expenses for this particular company. So it does not really meet with the first criteria, which means the uh, probable cash inflows or economic benefit. But for safety or environmental reasons, we have to treat that $30 million as the PPE. We can capitalize it okay, in our account. So very, very important concept that you have to understand. So after we look at the initial recognition, the next thing we'll be looking at initial measurement. Okay? As the next area. Initial measurement, which means the values that we're going to put onto the phase of the financial statement. A very, very important concept, according to a conceptual framework, is to use historical cost method. So historical cost method, which means how much that we paid. And of course, it will be divided into two circumstances. First, it will be the capital expenditure. So remember, the capital expenditure is where we're going to directly debit PPE at cost. So PPE at cost needs to be disclosed separately along with accumulated depreciation. Okay? And also we've got the revenue expenditure, which means these are the expenses that we incur which cannot be debiting the PPR costs. What we should do is to debit the corresponding expenses and credit cash. So, for example, we spend the training costs, we spend the advertising expenses and so on and so forth, and that's how we do it. 
For capital expenditure, very important, eh? It's something that we paid. So, something that we paid includes purchase costs or the purchase price. In order to purchase an item of PPE, you look at the amount uh, charged uh, in the invoice and in the corresponding contract. At the same time, you also need to consider the non-refundable taxes. So the non-refundable taxes, uh, we got the import duty if we were to import an item of PPE from a board and we pay the tax to a tax authority which can't be reclaimed or perhaps we got the VAT or VAT, value added tax, so we can call it the sales tax we paid but not refunded by a tax authority and in this particular case the amounts that we paid because it's based on the historical cost method the amounts that we paid we're going to be debiting the PPE at cost and also we got other direct costs into bringing the asset into the present location and condition. Uh, so for example, if I were to buy an item of PPA, I have to pay for $200 for the transportation cost. That's commonly known as carriage inward. Of course, it would include, for example, the transportation cost, as we mentioned before, bringing the asset into the base space. At the same time, we may also have the handling costs as well. And these are the costs that we incur. For example, when the assets arrive, uh, for example, uh, outside our factory, we have to use a forklift truck to uh, bring the asset inside our business. And these are known as the handling costs. At the same time, we may have the site preparation costs, which means we're going to prepare our site first of all so we can bring the asset in. And the installation costs into making sure that the asset uh, will be in a present condition for us to, for us to use. And also, any professional fees, especially when you are buying an asset, a piece of equipment, you may need to engage an expert, for example, a lawyer, in drafting the contract for you. And the fees that we pay to a lawyer is an example of the professional fees. And also, we've got the testing costs as well. So, for example, until we sign our name, receiving the asset, and we are satisfied with the asset, not returning it back to the supplier, we may test it using the equipment to produce some sort of items, or, for example, 10 uh, tested products. We may incur, for example, uh, $100 to do that, but at the same time, after we produce those items, we may sell it at the discount. So remember, if we have discount to sell those items, for example, we incurred $100 into producing those items, uh, these are the testing costs. At the same time, we expect to sell them at $30. So at the total of $70, it's like the realizable value should be capitalized. Okay? So, not the 30, not the 100, but the net of 70 should be capitalised. And of course, we've got staff costs as well. Staff costs, in relation to buying this equipment, we need another staff, we need to pay a salary, something like that. Um, these are not training costs, but the staff costs associated, directly related to the contract, related to the PPE and we need to capitalise it. And these are examples of direct costs. And finally, we may have dismantling costs as well. So these are 
costs that we expect to incur at some point in the future, perhaps in 20 years' time, into removing the asset and restoring the environment okay, in the first place. This is usually required by laws and regulation. In this case, for example, we purchase asset now for $100. We expect that we incur $20 of this monthly cost to be incurred at some point in the future. And we have to discount it, for example, using a complete weight of cost of capital as a discount rate of 10%, for example, 1 plus 10%, for example, in 20 years' time, so for a power of 20. And for this amount, what we should do is to debit the PP at cost and to credit according to the IAS number 37 provision liability. And later on, at each of the reporting dates, we will unwind the expense. So, for example, if we take 20 divide into 1.1 for the power of 20, and now at the times that we acquire the asset, we will recognize of 2.98 and from one year onwards we would debit the finance cost because we are unwinding it which means we have to account for a time value of money effect by taking the 2.98 times by the discount rate of 10% which means 0.298 and to credit to unwind to increase the provision liability up by 0.298 each and every year. Of course, we have to accumulate it and times by 10% okay, to increase the finance costs and the associated provision liability. So these are examples of capital expenditure, but what about for revenue expenditure then? So revenue expenditure, we put in into p and as an expense. So for example, we've got the training cost. Because we are training the employees, the skills from the employees can't be taken away because the employees may leave the business or may become sick, something like that. The admin expense, the administrative expense. So for example, the staff costs related to the admin staff, the initial operating losses, so for example, before we purchase the asset, uh, we have to relocate our business in somewhere else, and the initial operating losses, you cannot really capitalize it. And also a startup cost, Startup costs, and these are the costs in obtaining the license, and these costs should be expensed rather than being capitalized. And finally, the maintenance expense related to the asset, the repair expense related to the asset, which do not really increase its capacity. So these costs are generally known as revenue expenditure and should be expensed. So, after we done with the initial measurements, which means we debit the PP at cost, for example, 1 million, and then debit expense, let's say 0.3 million, and we credit cash, but for expense, for example, we haven't paid for that yet, we credit a payables or crude expense of 0.3 million. So now let's have a look at a few examples of putting all of these all together. First of all, the test company incurred $100,000 testing expenses to test the machine to ensure it functions properly. A few samples of pots were produced during the testing phase and the net proceeds from selling these products are 10000 So in other words, we incurred $100,000 in the testing process and we sold this product and getting an inflow of 10000 The monies that we paid or the cost or the two costs to the test company 
is only 100,000 minus 10,000, which means $90,000. According to the concept of historical cost method, we should only capitalize $90,000 as PPA. Next question, INC company. So this example is related to the incidental income of expenses. So let's see. INC company develops a building and rents it to employees as apartment. So in most circumstances, these apartments can be recognized as PPE according to ICE number 16. Okay? Because they are used by the internal employees. But the building is partly finished and INC company rents parts of its spa space in the building to employees incurs electricity and maintenance costs. So in other words, this building has not been finished. If that's the case then, well, we can't really recognize it as the PPE or our PPE. But this is not the point. The point is, it incurred electricity and maintenance costs. Should we capitalize these costs or should we expense them into the PNO? Well, these costs are the small costs in renting the uh, apartment to employees that we incur. Not the cost that we necessarily have to pay in order to acquire this asset. And from this perspective, we can call it as the incidental cost, which should be put in a PL by debiting the expense and credit cash. An easy company gets rental income from employees and from the car parking, uh, from the car park as well. So this income again should be uh, recognized as the income in the PL as well by debiting cash and credit income. Now let's have a look at an integrated example of what sorts of items should be recognized as a PPE and what should be expensed. So I'm going to use tick as the capital expenditure, I use cross as the revenue expenditure, which means put into the PNO. So, first one, purchase price including value added tax of 14%, but the tax can be refunded, which means we do not have to pay for it. So, what's VAT? Well, you've got the purchase price. The purchase price is VAT exclusive, which means do not include VAT. And we plot the VAT, and this will be the total price, or the total purchase price, which includes VAT, which means VAT inclusive. In this case, the VAT inclusive price is 570000 14% of VAT, based on 100% of original cost, the VAT inclusive price will be a total of 114%. If you take 570,000 divided into 114%, and that would be 500,000 for, for the purchase price excluding VAT. And that's why the VAT is only $70,000, which can be reclaimed, we debit the input VAT, we debit the PPR cost of $500,000, and we credit cash paid of $570,000. And that's why the only items that we can capitalize is the original cost, excluding the refundable VAT of $500,000. So capital expenditure, is 500,000, but the remaining 70,000 is not revenue expenditure because we're only debiting the input VAT liability to reduce our tax liability down by 70,000. Second, in import duties not refundable. Yes, 100,000 would be the capital expenditure. Installation costs, yes. Transportation costs, yes. But Staff party to celebrate the acquisition of PPE, having a party and training costs of 14, that should be the revenue expenditure. Admin revenue, testing to ensure 
plant fully operational before it starts with production? Yes, it's capital expenditure. But at the same time, the proceeds from self samples during testing. And in this case, as I said before, we should subtract the 13,000 from the original testing costs to be the amount that we can capitalize as a PPE. Advertising expenses, revenue expenditure, initial operating losses due to relocation to another place, revenue expenditure, and finally, estimated cost of dismantling, yes, it's the capital expenditure, we should debit to PPR costs. So as I mentioned again and again, the PPR cost, what is it? Let's go back to your book at the start. We can see the cost here. So if we see the PPR costs, two circumstances would go into the PPR cost. First, that you pay for it using your cash, your cash equivalent. And second, it means the fair value. Which means, for example, in a subsequent measurement, for example, we may use revaluation model to revalue the asset. And the changes in the value of the asset due to the changes in fair value, we put it or we account for it in the PPR cost. Okay? Very, very important concept. Let's continue. We now wish to have a go at the next thing because we finished the initial measurement and now let's have a look at subsequent measurement. Okay. Very, very important concept. Uh, which means that we pay for something at the start and what would be the value at the end of the reporting period. So that's commonly known as the subsequent measurement. The first thing that we need to understand related to the subsequent measurement is the idea of accounting policies. So the, according to the accounting policies uh, in the ICE number 16, we can either use the cost model or the revaluation model. It's entirely up to the business to do that. It's cost model, which means historical cost model, revaluation model, which means we're going to revalue the uh, PPE, and then we'll be recognising the fair value changes and putting it into the revaluation reserve as the capital reserve in our equity element. And once we understand that, the next thing is we may frequently replace the asset or renew the asset. And of course, we need to capitalise it as well. And for those major inspection costs or overhaul costs that we spend, we may capitalise it as a PPE if it qualifies as the whole overhaul costs. So, for example, you've got an item of PPE worth of one million, and now we're going to spend six hundred thousand dollars as a major inspection cost. So that six hundred thousand dollars accounted for sixty percent of the PPE value. And in most jurisdictions, for example, in mainland China, if you're going to spend uh, 50 percent or more as the inspection costs you can capitalize that inspection cost as the PPE so that's an example of overhaul cost and next one will be covering the exchange of asset so the question is why are we going to exchange our asset so for example we've got some assets in our business are going to exchange our asset with a new one. Why? Or with a similar one? Uh, perhaps we're going to simply be replacing it, renewing it, it's fine. Uh, perhaps that's not the case because in some circumstances in the past businesses may try to exchange their asset to window dress their financial statement to make the financial statements look better. So here it really depends on whether the transaction has commercial substance or not. 
if I've got an asset worth hundred dollars and we exchange that asset with a new one with a fair value, still a hundred dollars, and in this case it does not really have a commercial substance and therefore uh, we'll be having different accounting treatment. Of course, if the answer is yes, we'll be focusing on the fair value. And if the answer is no, on the other hand, uh, we may use it as the balancing figure. I will be looking at a particular question for that. No worries for that whatsoever. Okay. So, these are sort of things that we'll be covering. First thing is the O item uh, replacement of how we account for it. Let's see the company A example first of all. Company A spent $100 million in replacing the item of PPE. The current value of the O item was 50. Okay, now we got the item worth of 50 and then we're going to spend $100 to replace the new uh, replace the old asset with the new one. In this case, because that we spent a hundred dollars already, and that's why we should debit the PP at cost to hundred, and then we credit cash worth hundred. And at the same time, because we remove the old asset worth of fifty, and that's why we put it as a loss in our PL worth of fifty. And we credit the PP at current value worth of 50. And that's how we do it. And of course, uh, if you're accounting for the whole transaction, you, you can't really credit the PP at current value. What you have to do is to credit PP at costs of 80 and debit accumulated depreciation of 30, which gives you the same effect of crediting the PP at current value. Because in our exam, no problem whatsoever, you can credit PP at current value, but in the real accounting practice, we shouldn't do that. Let's look at the exchange of asset, first of all. Looking at the company A example, exchange is an item of PPE. The original cost of 60 accumulated depreciation of 40 which means the carrying value at the time that it was exchanged is $20 million. The fair value of the exchange of the old item is 15, so we exchange with a new item being the fair value of $15 million. Okay then, right, which means we got uh, something that's quite fair, uh, the carrying value, we got a carrying value worth of 20, uh, and we also need to pay cash of three. We are not exchanging something that is exactly the same or identical, being the fair value of $15 million. Fair value means the value if we put $15 million in there and the buyer will buy it, instantly buy it. So, because we've got the asset worth, of, I mean, the fair value of 15, we need to pay additional $3 million. That seems to be quite fair because. We're exchanging uh, uh, something that we may see fit, we may value. And difference in value has commercial substance, no problem for that. And that's why, how are we going to account for it? Well, it's simple, because we are having the new asset, the new PPE. The new PPE worth of 15 million, and we spend cash of three and we're going to recognise the PPA at cost of 18 million. At the same time, we credit cash of 3 million because we pay for that. And we're going to be debits the PPA, the new PPA, and we're going to give up our old PPA. So the old PPA, we're going to recognize it at cost and accumulated depreciation which means the carry amount and in this case as you can see the carry value of 20 okay. so therefore we've got a balancing figure we're going to recognize it as a loss on exchange 
of five million dollars. Of course, when we are crediting the old PP at carrying value, effectively we are crediting the PP at cost of sixty and debiting the accumulated depreciation worth of forty. Which means in essence we are crediting the PP at current value worth of twenty. Let's have a look at another example where the uh, transaction has no commercial substance. Company A exchanges an item of PP with the current value being 100, fair value 120, with the new PPE with the fair value of 120. Because as you can see, the fair value is 80, but uh, we are paid 40, which means we can receive 120. We are giving up something that's worth 120 and receiving something, including the asset and cash, worth 120, which means the fair value exactly the same. So the accounting standards uh, states that it has no commercial substance if you are exchanging something with the exact same fair value. So if that's the case, how are we going to account for it? We receive $40 million of cash. At the same time, we're going to give up our original PPE worth of 100. And that's why we're going to put a balancing figure on this. We're going to debit the new PPE worth of 60 instead of being 80, something like that. Okay? So that's how we are going to be uh, stopping the window dressing issue that may be in place in our business. APC, accounting for your future.